Jogindra Radha, as we all know, uh, Prabhupada Jogindra said that it's a very small universe, not everybody will know it, but I'm sure people who have gathered here knows Jogindra Radha. Uh, Jogindra Radha has been associated with the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi. And he's been very much involved in the kind of, um, his uh, focus has been on issues of uh, low needy and uh, on governance, to put it in, the, in simply. And he's also been a person who has uh, contested the elections as the Amadi Party candidate. And, and I, I must say a little word of you, Gendra, because I think we're taking it away. I really want to, to focus on, on, on you and your, your, the whole experience that you've are offering many of us to today in India. When I wrote to him, I didn't know how to describe the Southern Collective, you know? So I said, no, we are a group of uh, vagabonds. We are, you know, all kinds of strange people. We, yes, we stand up for the truth sometimes. We get battered for it sometimes. We're inside the jail for it. But sometimes, you know, it's, it's people who are trying to say no, people who continue to search, people who are rooted locally, but are also searching for wings. And I got back this wonderful little note from Yogendra who said, quoted this paragraph that I wrote about the vagabonds that we are, and he said, this is like music to my ears, you know? <laughs> this is the kind of group that I want to be with. So welcome, Yogendra. You are here, and we are waiting to listen to you. Friends, delighted to be here. And I say this not as a piece of formality which precedes every lecture. When Corinne wrote to me to say we are vagabonds, I mean, the words that struck to my mind were vagabond, search, something equivalent to crazy. And I said, yes, I have to do it. Because this world has never been shaped by normal people. It's only those who step outside that bounds and explore things beyond that uh, who shape this world, who can make it a different world. So that, that's how I got attracted. Also, I felt there was a need within me. I'm sick and tired of giving one-line response, a 20-second response to how the world looks like this morning. Or to somehow phrase my reaction to whatever is happening in exactly 144 characters, which I do every day. <laughs> or answering at least nine times a day a question that I've faced for the last nine months of my life. Why did Arvind Kejriwal resign? <laughs> so I said, all right, let me go to some place where I would think a little beyond these things, something bigger, something fundamental, something more meaningful. Ramadhan Lohia wrote this book, uh, these were essays, uh, which he entitled Interval During Politics. And I find myself exactly at that moment of a bit of an interval. And as I talk about interval, the news arrives this afternoon that Delhi Assembly has been dissolved. So my interval is about to end. <laughs> and uh, this interval, as uh, another friend said, it is a creative moment. It's a moment to take a deep breath, moment to think of a somewhat larger frame. And that's what I'm going to do today. I take liberty and not limit myself only to Mr. Modi, the world created by Mr. Modi, and possibilities of combating it. That is a real question. I will definitely come to it. But if you permit me set an alap before that, I'm told in Kanatki music there is no alap. But in, there is. Lovely. Then it's fine. Uh, in Hindustani there is. So allow me to frame what I'm going to say with two broader contexts before I come to India of today and Mr. Modi and the challenge and the dark moment and the opportunities and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't plan to talk very much about my party. 
but would be very happy to answer any questions. Uh, I thought a platform like this is for something much deeper, much larger than to use it as a platform for party propaganda. Those who want to listen to it are most welcome tomorrow. I'm speaking in Bangalore. I'll speak about all those things. But this is a somewhat different and special moment, which I don't wish to waste on those things. Two things happened today. I mean, in a moment, this is a moment marked by two events. As I said a minute ago, Delhi Assembly has been dissolved today. And many people in the country would see it as a victory, momentary victory, of uh, democratic power. That Delhi should not be ruled from back door. And that people of Delhi should have a choice in deciding what kind of government they have, would be seen as testimony of the power of people and of democracy. Today also happens to be the 14th anniversary of Sharmila Irom's fast against Armed Forces Special Powers Act. That reminds us of limits to democracy, of what, of questions and of the walls that surround democratic practices, walls that do not allow us to penetrate, to go beyond. Much of what I say today would be a play on both these possibilities and limitations. And I hope to persuade all of us that the terrain between these two possibilities and constraints is the terrain of politics in which we explore another world, the possibility of creating another kind of universe. As I said, I want to begin by framing contemporary politics in, with the help of two larger frames. One is a larger frame of 21st century universe, the world in 21st century, and where are we headed? Where should we be headed? It may be too large a frame for today's occasion, and I can already see many people here in the gathering who are much better qualified than I am to talk about those frames. Yet I must say something about it as a prelude to what I'm going to say later. Something of what I'm going to say later would not make sense unless I introduce that larger frame because that is what politics is. That's where what and why of politics originates. Second frame is that of India's democratic experience in the last 65 years or so. Where do we stand there? These two larger frames would then bring us to specifically focusing on India of 2014, Mr. Modi and thereafter. So beginning with the first one, a larger understanding of where we are placed in the 21st century. And please don't interrogate me too deeply on this, because as I can see, there are many people who should be answering those questions and not me. But let me begin with some plain, bland assertions. In the 21st century, we are trying to re-enact certain dreams of the 19th century borrowed from a tiny part of the world that we today called the North. Several solutions, brilliant solutions at times, which came up from that tiny part of the world, Europe and North America, which may have been good, may have been brilliant, may have been just the right solutions, today masquerade as universal templates to think about everything. The capacity of those 
specific solution for specific occasions and specific time, place. The capacity of those solutions to become global templates today is what needs to be challenged. Politics of 21st century has to be a politics of challenging those templates. Not necessarily challenging those ideas. Each of those templates takes upon a human need, a human desire. Something that all of us need feel. But it distorts that human urge into a certain institutional form which actually denies those very urge. All this is abstract. Let me come to specifics. There are four large templates that we play with in the 21st century. Democracy, nation-state, development and science. These four large templates govern our existence and in all these four respects a peculiar local solution today masquerades as a global solution on democracy a certain form of liberal representative democracy has today become the only game in town, the only political format that all of us are invited to participate in. And we are told the only alternative to this is dictatorship. So we are offered this alternative. Take dictatorship and if you don't want dictatorship, take liberal representative democracy regimes as have been practiced by Europe and North America in the last 100, 200 years or so. A basic human urge for self-rule, a basic human expression of freedom, I want to run my life the way I want it. I want decisions concerning my life in such a way that I have a voice in those decisions. This is an absolutely fundamental human urge. But that has been given an institutional expression which is very limited and limiting. This is being challenged. It's been challenged by the experience of people both in the North and in the Global South. It's been challenged by those who realize that this model of representative politics takes decision making away from the people that it takes locus of decision making away from the people. So those who want decentralization, those who want participation are challenging that idea. But it continues to be the dominant idea of our times. The second idea, that of a nation state, is an idea that originated in a peculiar European inability to deal with diversity. It's a peculiar European affliction which is now being imposed on the rest of the universe. Tired with their history of being unable to deal with sectarian and other forms of conflicts. Europe comes up with this idea that cultural and political boundaries must match. That is to say, 
within political boundaries of a state, you should have people belonging to one cultural identity, no more, no less. Every cultural identity needs to have a state and every state needs to have one cultural identity, not more than that. This is a solution that comes up, as I said, due to peculiar situations of one particular part of the world, which increasingly becomes the dominant answer, which we today see as nation-state. And to my mind, no other idea has caused greater bloodshed in this universe than the idea of nation-state. That idea faces challenge. It faces challenge from the reality of the universe. The fact that in most parts of the world, a political unit always comprises more than one cultural unit. That political and cultural boundaries simply do not match. And any attempt to match them would involve so much of bloodshed that humankind cannot afford. It is also being challenged by migration, by intercultural transfers, which have now begun to affect even the North. Even Germany has to now worry about Turkish population. Britain has to worry about all the Gujaratis and Punjabis and Pakistanis who are there. In the long run, this model of nation-state, this template of organizing cultural diversity in political units, this template has to go. Something else has to come in its place. The third idea that of a certain way of looking at development is something that I need not speak at great length in this room because now that I realize something that I did not when I accepted the invitation uh, I knew about Vimochna, I knew about Timbuktu Collective but somehow I had not heard about Southern Collective um, so but now that I realize what your history has been and the kind of persons involved here I just have to say in a summary formulation that a certain way of looking at economic well-being has become the dominant template of our times. You know, this desire for what we call development, unlimited economic growth leading to consumerism achieved through a particular model of big capital, big industry, big cities at the cost of environment, at the cost of future generations has become the dominant model of our times. I must note it in parenthesis that this is not a model confined only to what we call capitalism. This was very much the model pursued by what we call communism. The, the, the basic economic model was not fundamentally different. This model is being challenged <coughs> by those who worry about equity, those who worry about justice and by those who think about ecology. From both dimensions, both, for both directions, this model has come to be challenged and we look for an alternative. The fourth idea, that of science modern science and technology 
as the only institutional or the most advanced institutional expression of human search quest for truth and knowledge gets embodied in all forms in modern medicine in uh, all kinds of engineering technological marvels and so on but more than any of those it gets embedded at an epistemological plane. This is the only form of acquiring knowledge. This is the only legitimate mode of acquiring knowledge. All the rest is doubtful. I studied in a small town where at the right page of uh, whenever you were in class 9, you were required to choose your stream. In those days, in class 9, you had to choose which wherever you wanted to go. <coughs> All the intelligent ones went to sciences. And those who did not take sciences, people said, oh, you have taken nonsense. And sp sp spoken with somewhat Punjabi accent, it actually sounded nonsense. <laughs> so the division of world into science and nonsense uh, is, is, is a deep division that challenges us, uh, that seeks to colonize our imagination about how human beings acquire knowledge. This too has been challenged. It's been challenged by human experience practices all over the world. It has been challenged at a philosophic plane. So in other words, what I'm saying is that this basic human quest for self-rule has been templatized into modern representative liberal democracy. Quest for belonging has been templatized into nation states, which sometimes look like football clubs, where you have your basic identity is born out of an accident, but you hold on to it as if you chose, as I say, keep saying in Hindi, Jesse application they keep out with. You have to like to be born on this side or that side. Basic human desire, human urge of a certain urge for entrepreneurship has been templatized into modern development of a certain kind. And human quest for truth has been templatized as modern science and technology. Politics of alternatives to my mind is about this. We live in the tyranny of no alternatives. We have lived for far too long in the tyranny of no alternatives. This tyranny has been challenged, and I myself listed in every respect where it has been challenged. It has not yet been broken. The challenge of politics is to break it. The challenge of philosophers is to supply us epistemic grounds to question it. The challenge of economists is to work out alternative models. For me, the challenge of politics is to bring all these epistemic challenges together and mount an assault on the tyranny of no alternatives. For me, that is politics of the 21st century. Underlying all these four beliefs, is an even deeper belief that something that happened in Europe in the last three to four hundred years was not only unique and special, but it is something that every human society is bound to and required to replicate. This belief, this deep cultural belief, in the uniqueness of 
European experience. I keep saying Europe, but please, when I talk about it, you can, you know, you can extend it to North America and Australia and New Zealand, etc. This, this idea that what we call modernity is telos, is a certain goal towards which everyone has to and should walk, is an idea that is being questioned today. It's being questioned not in the way in which it was questioned in the past. The first responses to, first critical responses to this modernity came in the form of a certain romantic rejection of this modernity, an attempt to wish to go back, wish to turn your back to this modernity. I think we as civilization have taken steps forward and for the first time in the last 25 or 30 years, we have now begun to say that there is an alternative, that we can create an alternative. As I said, for me, the point of politics is to break this tyranny of no alternatives, which has become possible for the first time. Not by turning our back to modernity, but by a, with the help of a confident relationship to the products and byproducts of modernity, with the help of a confidence in a sense to be able to relate to the world in the way in which Europe must have related to the universe when they were creating what we today call modernity. Because when all this was happening in Europe, they were not replicating anyone else's life. And what we are doing, we have done for far too long, is to replicate someone's autobiography, not even someone else's life. We end up replicating someone else's autobiography. There's this beautiful expression in Hindi, I don't know how to translate that. Uh, you know, uh, what is the English expression for that thing when cows, uh, you know, when they eat, and after that they <laughs> ruminate. That's right, sorry, I forgot. Uh, so, when I look at much of the thinking that takes place in the global south, and, or when I look at much of what happens in routine politics, uh, I say in Hindi, ye sirf jugali karne jaisa kaam nahi hai. Darsal, ye usse bhi bura hai. Khaya kisi aur gaya ne hai, aur mein uske muh ki taraf dekh ke jugali kar raha. <laughs> Sorry, did it get to you? <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a double mental slavery about what we do. There is a, you know, it's not merely the fact that I do not have food in my mouth and I'm just moving my mouth. But there's some relationship to the food that I've chewed. But when I start looking at someone else and try to move my mouth as if there is some food in my stomach, that is the kind of mental slavery which has been involved in our attempts to imitate modernity. As I said, it's an attempt to reenact not someone else's life, but someone else's autobiography. And we have reached a moment where we can question it. Not just question it, we can change it. That to me is the larger challenge of the 21st century. Let me jump now to the second frame. I'll try to be briefer there. Uh, which is about making sense of democratic experience of India in the last 45 years, last 67 years or so. 
because we continue to slide between celebrating India's democratic experience and saying it's no good, it's no democracy, hasn't delivered a thing, etc. I want us to think more carefully about it. And the metaphor that I use is that of entrenchment of democracy in India. I like the word entrenchment because it has dual connotations. Something that gets entrenched is firm, it's here to stay. But the moment something gets entrenched, it limits. It puts walls around what you can do. This is how we should see India's democratic experience. The problem is not that democracy did not take roots in India. India is a very good example to study limitations of liberal democracy outside European context because the experiment actually worked. By global standards, it's a model case of success. Everywhere else, democracies collapsed. India was the one country except the 19 months of emergency where democracy became the only rule of the only game in town, where elections take place regularly ruling parties lose election, they actually give up power. Someone else actually takes over power. These are, these are unusual events if you look at globally. The experience of democracy has not been like this. And not merely that elections take place, people actually participate in those elections. They vote. And not merely the well-to-do, actually the poor, the marginalized actually vote. And as some of our research has shown, Unlike in the rest of the world, those at the lower strata of society actually vote even more than those at the upper end, which is exactly the opposite of the global trend. All over the world, as you travel from the, from the top to the bottom of social, economic or educational hierarchy, voting turnout goes down. Just check it on the website, National Election Study of the US, everywhere else in the world. In India, it's exactly the other way around. The poor, marginalized, Dalits vote much more than Mumbaikers, Bangaloreans and everyone else does. So it's a success. India also managed to defy the initial forecasts of collapse of democracy. They said democracy won't survive in this country, so much poverty. Class war was about to take place. The revolution was just around the corner, except that it never arrived. They said caste divisions in India are such that democracy would be swallowed by <coughs> caste. In reality, it is caste which got domesticated by politics. Politics actually took care of caste. Has, politics has consumed caste. It's politics which actually decides caste configurations now. Religion remains a question. And in today's context, it would be silly to forget that religious divisions can remain questions that continue to flare up, continue to disrupt patterns. But it's fair to say that early fears about this country falling apart, India coming apart on questions of religion. That's a fear which has been somewhat set aside. We are dealing with different kinds of fears, not fears of India being divided once again on Hindu-Muslim lines. All the forecasts, and they were very serious forecasts, about India splitting up on linguistic grounds, there were books in the 1960s which said India as we had known it was only going to stay for another five years or so. Linguistic states, lots of very sensible and rational people said, was going to be the beginning of the end of India. Actually, linguistic states ended up strengthening Indian union of the kind that we have known it. If we look at the kind of diversity that India packs, and at the moment not talking of 
means used and we have already recalled uh, Iram Shamila's struggle. I'm simply speaking of the basics, which is to say a country that packs so much of diversity, what kind of life chances would we have given this country in 1947? India defies all those forecasts. <coughs> so it becomes, so India, India in that sense is a success case of democracy. It flourished where it was not meant to flourish. It defied those challenges which were supposed to have overcome India and would have, were supposed to have finished India. But democracy got entrenched in a negative sense as well. It got entrenched in a positive sense as I mentioned. But democracy also got entrenched in a negative sense, which is to say, democracy got entrapped in a little house. You can imagine that house with a floor and a ceiling and with four walls. The floor, so the, ch the real challenges to democracy have come from sources and quarters that we did not imagine to begin with, that we did not actually anticipate very much. Those which were anticipated have been dealt with. Those which were not anticipated are the ones which have seriously compromised the quality of democracy. The floor, I mean this is just a metaphor there, the floor is scale. The scale of democracy, the scale of representative democracy is simply so large. I can see Uday who contested election and I contested election. Both of were, were, us were expected within about two weeks to reach out to and address the demands and aspirations of nearly two million people Uday, mm -hmm. about 1.5 to 2 million voters. The scale of representative democracy in India is such that becoming a viable political force is well nigh impossible. Entry barriers are simply so high that it's very hard for anyone to come. Only those who are already there survive. Everyone else is thrown out routinely. Something which is made worse by our first past the post system. So it's very high entry system. The four walls, the four walls are information. Somehow we shared a certain romantic imagination of the media being the fourth estate and a pillar of democracy, a pillar of liberty and so on, which in many ways it is. And the record of Indian journalists has been exemplary in many ways. But if you do not look at journalists as persons, but if you look at media as an institution, then we are looking at serious information asymmetry of a kind that compromises the quality of democracy. Who gets to know what and who manages to communicate to whom involves such gross asymmetry that much of the conversation and thinking about democracy is reduced to a mockery. If I cannot reach my voice to my voters, what kind of an election are we talking about? So one wall is that of information asymmetry. Second wall I keep thinking of is, uh, I mean these are walls are those concerns which cannot be met in represent, are not being met and it's very hard to see how they will be met in the present kind of representative democracy. Second wall is environment. Trees do not have votes. Future generation does not have vote. And the kind of things that Uday Kumar is struggling against, there are some who have vote, who are with him, but if we were to include all those who would be affected by that 
plant. And if we were to give them vote, that would be of a different order altogether. But the limitation he has to work with is that in today's representative politics, he can draw upon only a small slice of what the potentially affected persons would be. This is a almost a permanent limitation. The third wall that I think about are marginal communities. Will, who are so small, numerically so small, that ignoring them almost completely would have no effect on electoral prospects of anyone. We think about sexual minorities, we think about other kinds of minorities. This is something which modern liberal representative democracy has found no way of listening to these voices. There are no institutional mechanisms that they must be heard. And fourth, it's harder one to accept, is public opinion itself. You know, we all applaud public. We all at the end of election day say, public knows everything, public is great. But the public opinion also happens to be the site of some of the deepest prejudices, some of the, some of the most um, poisonous ideas that need to be cured, that need to be reformed. That is hard for us to acknowledge because democracy stands on the bedrock of public opinion. But what if that public opinion itself is tilted or remains tilted, let's say, for 50 years or whatever? These are things for which modern liberal democracy has no answers. And as I said, the house has a floor and four walls, but it also has a ceiling. And the ceiling is economic limits to politics, both domestic and global. Our democratic experience is so severely limited now, in fact, more than before. And the irony is this, that at a time when all of us used to study in our university days, Marxist theories about the nature of the state and the state being a bourgeois agency, at that time, actually the state enjoyed far more autonomy than we were willing to grant it. And when you hear about what's happening in Orissa mines, when you hear about what's happening in Chhattisgarh, when you hear about deals of oil and gas, when you think about Reliance Empire, the state actually is an agency of the bourgeoisie. I and mean, there's no other way of describing it. And this is where, so just when the Marxist theory began to recognize the autonomy of the state, was a moment then when the state was actually losing all its autonomy. So today, more than in the past, there are severe economic limits to what the state can do. Elections or no elections. You would promise all kinds of things about black money when you are in opposition. The day you come to power, you will say exactly what a ruling party and you know power must speak. And this is this these things are just given to you. So, I just wanted to draw our attention to this frame of India's democratic experience uh, so that we can think about our current predicament in a way which is somewhat different from the standard vocabulary that we have inherited. The two kinds of vocabulary that we have inherited, one of celebration, the other of non-recognition of what happens in democracies. Okay, with all this, let me now focus specifically on the current context of Mr. Modi, 2014 elections, and what happened there. It is fair to recognize that we have witnessed a very significant political change in the country. It is not merely an election victory. It is something more than that. Elections happen. 
parties win and lose, but BJP's victory in 2014 is significant because in many ways it changes the ground of politics. The pitch, it's not just that a team wins, that the wicket of politics, the pitch has been changed somewhat. It has been changed because BJP is emerging because A, the nature of, nature of competition has changed. It was Congress earlier as a almost national political force confronting BJP which had a much smaller pool to draw from and therefore had to depend on an extraordinary election to come anywhere close to majority because the Congress had a much larger pool to draw from and could do with a moderate success. BJP had a smaller pool to deal with and had to deal with, had to almost draw everything from that pool to come anywhere close to success. This basic equation may have been altered by this election. My own sense is that five years down the line, BJP would have a much larger pool to draw from. Congress will have a much smaller pool to draw from, which changes the nature of competition altogether. You know, because if BJP, in other words, I look less at what BJP has done in Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Rajasthan and so on. I look more closely at what BJP has done in West Bengal, Assam, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana. For the first time, BJP is actually beginning to emerge as a national political force of a kind that Congress used to be. For Congress, it's not only an election defeat. It's much more than that. It could actually challenge the existence of Congress as a nationwide political party. I know it's very easy to write obituaries of political parties after an election defeat. But what's happened to Congress this time is something very serious. Last two decades show us that whenever Congress has fallen below the 20% threshold in any state, it has just sunk thereafter. It has never bounced back. Tamil Nadu, West Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, the same story. Several other states could be added to that after this time. Possibly Telangana possibly Andhra Pradesh, perhaps Haryana and Maharashtra. Add to it another category of states where Congress exists, is the dominant opposition, but is only a notional opposition. It's there because there is no one else. Congress is in perpetual opposition, not performing the role of opposition. Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Odisha, that's a bent straight away. Congress exists but doesn't quite exist. Now, if you just put all of that together and think of the leadership quality that Congress enjoys today and think of the fact that Congress simply doesn't know how to be in opposition, then the situation is right that there is a possibility that Congress, as we have known, can just sink as a national political presence. I'm not making a forecast that it will, but there is a serious possibility. Congress bounced back after 1977, but remember, it had Indira Gandhi at that time. This changes the nature of political competition in the country. Second, let's also acknowledge the fact that public opinion has shifted. Mr. Modi's victory is not merely a victory of manipulation. There is a lot of manipulation. There is a lot of political gimmickry. There is excessively friendly media. All that is true. 
But let's not forget that public opinion has also shifted. I do not know if you experience that, but in places that I know somewhat intimately, I know that the kind of things you could not talk about 10 years ago are very easily spoken of in drawing room conversations, especially relating to minorities. 10 years ago, you wouldn't dare speak that was politically incorrect. And there was no government, no state to monitor you. But you thought this is not done. Today, you can talk about it on WhatsApp, on Facebook, everywhere. Something has shifted in our public opinion and has shifted for the worse. And that is a point that we must recognize. Mr. Modi's victory is based on, is a response to something real out there. You know, I'm saying all these things and maybe I may end up overstating the case, but I want to say it with all the emphasis at my command because people like us sitting in rooms like this who share a certain political conviction, it's very easy for us to delude ourselves into believing that Mr. Modi has done a little trick, it's a passing phase, you know, this is, uh, he did this and this was, this is based on lies, deceits, it will disappear, etc. Much of that is true, there is lie, there is deceit and everything's fine. But I want us to remember and acknowledge that he is responding to something real out there. And he's responding. There are three, three kinds of anxieties that Mr. Modi has responded to. One is anxiety on the score of governance. People felt there was no leadership. That, and, and all the three anxieties are anxieties that the Congress-led UPA government had created. There are three kinds of vacuums that got created. And Mr. Modi has stepped comfortably into those three. One in the end is an anxiety about governance. Is there a leadership in the country? Do we know who's taking decision? Can we trust these people to take decisions about my country? Is there someone who can give a vision to the country? This is an anxiety. Needless to say, watching Mr. Manmohan Singh giving those lectures from Red Fort, didn't inspire much confidence, even if you were to mute the camera, mute the voice. Just the experience of watching him speak for 10 years from Red Fort, you know. I mean, if you actually just mute it, you, you didn't understand a word of Hindi or English or any of Indian languages, mute your television, watch two of them on television. You begin to see a difference. People want to be able to look into the eyes of those who take decisions. They want to be able to trust. They want to be able to say that yes, these, there is some conviction at play here. That there is someone who can take decisions. Mr. Modi <coughs> steps into that anxiety and provides a solution. Strong leader. Now, we all know from the history of democracies and their collapse that this is the beginning of end of democracy in many countries. That dismantling of democracy has always happened on this platform of a strong leader. But do remember, there is an anxiety waiting to be addressed there. Mr. Modi provides a negative solution. Someone else has to come up with a positive solution. You cannot turn your back to this anxiety. Second, is an anxiety about development. It's very hard for people probably in this room to understand that because we have immunized ourselves from the, the desire for Bijli Pani Sarak, the desire for what people call development. Development as understood in the sense in which I have critiqued it a few minutes ago. That development is the currency of politics. This is the only vocabulary in which politics gets spoken. And 
the anxiety was do we have a government that can give us something by way of economic well-being upa government had the unique distinction of being able to annoy the rich as well as the poor at the same time of convincing both of them that the government was unable to look at you know, to look after their interests this creates an anxiety mr modi steps into that anxiety and promises growth at all costs and once again we know what does it mean to have growth at all costs we already have seen in the last few months i'm not into assessing any government in the first few months i think those judgments tend to be premature but on one count we can come to reasonably safe conclusion about mr modi's government that in environmental terms this is perhaps the most destructive government that india has ever seen indira gandhi for all her faults was not into destroying environment I mean, otherwise most of the destruction of this country can be credited to her but in this respect she was different and already the 10 or 12 things that the modi government has done in terms of dilution of all kinds of norms and so on indicates that in environmental terms we would have the perhaps the most destructive government that india has had at the center so growth at all cost is a solution to that anxiety about well being economic well being advancement we can again see it's a negative solution but we have to come up with this positive one the third is an is a cultural anxiety it's an anxiety of identity who am i do i have to be embarrassed in my own country about my religion about my cultural practices do i have you know you we can say sitting in this room it's very easy for us to come to a conclusion that much of this anxiety has been manufactured manufactured or otherwise there is an anxiety out there like in sri lanka we have almost reached a situation where the majority feels like a minority begins to act as if it's a minority this is what has been created there is a deeper cultural anxiety which is not merely a response to manmohan singh or congress or so on there is a deeper cultural anxiety felt most acutely by those who actually make a transition to urban india the first generation transition walas these are the ones who feel that anxiety most acutely anxiety about cultural identity of belonging my heritage do i connect to it do this english speaking elite understand what uh, what i feel do they relate do they connect these are anxieties out there mr modi provides a solution majoritarianism we are in majority don't worry you know why do you need to be embarrassed these secular lunatics should be thrown away this is your country if you can't have hindu temple in this country where will you go to have hindu temples you know so this is this is a certain solution that he offers needless to say all three solutions that mr modi offers i have just said are negative solutions or sometimes i put it more sharply which is to say mr these in these three fundamental sense mr modi is opposed to the very idea of india because in these three rest these three things actually define a certain way of understanding india is what defines the very idea of india and in that sense mr modi lies at the intersection of those three lines which defy or which go against the very foundations of india yeah. that's why i keep saying that there's nothing very special about mr modi because you know uh destroying democracy giving authoritarian solutions is not something mr modi has done, may have done for the first time it's been practiced gandhi dynasty and etc must get their due credit for all this 
on economic terms, he's not the only one to promise growth at all cost. And on cultural front, he's not the originator of majoritarianism. What makes him unique is that he lies at the point of intersection of all these three. That is what is so peculiar to Mr. Modi. That's what makes him so special in negative ways. But the point I wish to make here is that, can I just continue speaking? Yeah. 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 And not worry about the mic. Louder. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've taught for 10 years, so it's a okay. <laughs> used to this. Uh, I think it got frightened when it took 10 years. It sort of a mic day though. The point I'm making here is that Mr. Modi feeds on three anxieties which are felt by ordinary Indians. And people sitting in this room have to come up with positive alternative ways of addressing these anxieties. We cannot pretend that it's a passing phase. We cannot adopt the usual vocabulary of Modi bashing. It gets us nowhere. I can assure you our routine standard Modi bashing, which we will all do when we sit down for a cup of coffee, has no resonance among ordinary people. You and I are absolutely convinced that Mr. Modi is doing these 10 things and we have already come to a final conclusion about his regime. I'm afraid we are not convincing anyone. I must also say that the most natural political reflex of let's all unite against this threat, <coughs> it's not going to work. It actually will be counterproductive. The more you have anti-BJP alliances, the more entrenched BJP will become. <coughs> In Bihar, Lalu Prasad Yadav and Nitish Kumar have come to have formed an alliance. The alliance has unfortunately had success because they managed to defeat BJP in by-elections. What they do not see is that if that alliance becomes somewhat medium-term alliance of Bihar politics, it would end up entrenching BJP like never before. BJP will become the kind of force in Bihar politics which it has never been. So the standard trick of secular alliance against communal forces, in my understanding, will be deeply counterproductive. The only way forward is to come up with, not just come up with, not alternative coalitions, but with alternative politics. Something that addresses these concerns. On governance, those of us who believe in decentralized democracy have to find a way of convincing ordinary people that decentralized democracy actually delivers. It delivers results. It gets you something. Voltage. Those who believe in alternatives to development have to come up with, and I, I know some of us may not agree. My own journey has been exactly to the route that most of you have taken here. But I really have come to believe that thinking about economy is going to be the asset test of our future politics. And old style ways of thinking about economy simply won't do. We have to come up with intelligent models. The trouble, as I keep saying, is the economic right in this country has no politics. And the economic left has no economics. <laughs> we have to come up with something that combines intelligent economics with our values that we so deeply uphold. It's not going to be easy. But I really think that for future politics, having a viable future politics, we have to come up with ways that 
intelligently use markets. Markets are here to stay. Intelligent use of market with a structure of incentives and disincentives which would push markets into achieving the kind of objectives that we want to do. So a lot of thinking has to take place there. And finally, on cultural front, those who oppose Mr. Modi must appear to be at least as much of an inheritor of our cultural traditions as Mr. Modi manages to appear once in a while. <laughs> if we do not appear to be, you know, if we do not look like people who take some deep pride in this country's diverse cultural traditions, we don't have to follow one tradition, it would be suicidal, then there would be no difference between Mr. Modi and us. But being able to relate deeply, not just superficially, when CPM issues a booklet on Vivekananda, it's laughable. Because I would not begin to read that book. Because I know that these people <coughs> never take Vivekananda seriously. Why would I even begin to open that book? You have to deeply relate and acknowledge the fact that much of what has passed off as radicalism in our country has always had a streak of self-hatred. That self-hatred has to be erased and a deeper connection to this country's cultural traditions have to be related, developed. For us to be able to challenge Mr. Modi, in that sense, what the old man did, who claimed that he was a Sanatani Hindu above all, we are all offended, we all find him X, Y, and Z. But that claiming that he was a Sanatani Hindu gave Gandhiji the, the, the footing on which he could actually take on this kind of communalism during partition. So that to me is, a, is the only way it can fall, go forward. So what we need Number one then is alternative imagination in all these three respects, politics, economy, culture. We also need to make it viable. The trouble is when we think about alternative politics, we all keep thinking about alternatives. We forget the word politics there. Politics requires viability. Viability presupposes scale. Scale of requirements of scale is one of the least understood dimensions of our politics. You know, it's like in, in, in economics, they always think about scale. And I never understood why in politics people don't think sufficiently about the problems of scale. You know, requirements of scale are so high that any political alliance, any politics that remains below that minimum scale is doomed to failure. And in this respect, unfortunately, small is not beautiful. <coughs> That's the problem. The highest scale of some of our biggest movements, alternative movements, is smaller than the minimum scale required for politics. I think of Narmada Bachao Andolan. All the sort of energy of Narmada Bachao Andolan, in quantitative terms, please don't think I undermine it. Just four days ago, as Walter would justify it, I have spoken about Medhadi and the glorious you know, achievements of that movement. But the entire energy in quantitative terms of Narada Bachao Andolan is smaller than one parliamentary constituency of India. So the highest of our movements is below the minimum required for politics. So there is that challenge. Challenge of visibility. Challenge of cross-sectional mobilization. The trouble is that in movements, you can focus on one issue and one section. In politics, you don't even begin to do politics unless you do a cross-sectional mobilization. <coughs> yes, occasionally you can say that I will keep 1% out. You can be very radical and revolutionary and say I will keep 10% out. You cannot do more than that. You simply cannot do politics of less than 90% of population in order to be successful. I mean, your pool has to be 90%. You can say 
This 1% I don't care, I don't need Mr. Ambani's vote. You know, you can say things of that kind. But cross-sectional mobilization is the minimum requirement of politics. Along with that is a requirement of a broad bandwidth of issues. You cannot do politics on one issue. You've got to address a very large number of issues, many of which conflict with each other. How do you mediate between those is, again, a standard challenge of politics. Just mention two more. Uh, challenge of imagining and thinking of working democratic organizations. Organizations which are both democratic and they work. We get either or options in these respects. Organizations which are democratic and don't do anything, they simply oblige history by existing, and those which are dynamic, energetic, and there is no democracy there. How do we combine the two? And finally, something that might surprise you, but that's something which I have discovered. We need to have spiritual foundations for political action. And this I do not speak as a scholar, I am not a spiritual person, but having practiced politics for some time, I really think it's impossible to practice politics of a meaningful variety without a relationship with the inner self. And that is something about which radical politics thought least. We have simply not reflected on this question at all in the 20th century revolutionary tradition. So these are questions that need to be thought about. It may look like too vast an agenda. It may look like an impossible thing. It may look like too big a response to a small melody called Mr. Narendra Modi. But I seriously do believe that if we wish to respond to the situation, not just the person, but the situation, then this is the bigger challenge and we need to come up with a very different kind of response. Not just to Mr. Modi. He happens to symbolize certain forces. But I began by talking about you know, future of alternate politics in 21st century. And I keep making that distinction between alternatives to politics, which is deadly and dangerous, Political alternatives, which are routine and standard and not worth getting into. And alternative politics, which is what we are discussing here. Alternative politics, to my mind, has to be about redefining the very terrain of politics. That is the challenge we face. I keep saying very often that politics is the yuga dharma of our times which is to say, if we want to reshape the world, politics is an essential part of that reshaping of the world today. In that sense, politics is a yogdha. And to my mind, and I agree with John, who said that what appears to be a dark moment could actually be a historic opportunity. I think we are knocking at a historic opportunity, provided we are willing to convert this challenge into a moment for reflection, a moment to rethink some of our fundamentals, a moment to look ahead. And who knows, a few years or a few decades down the line, we might actually be grateful to Mr. Modi for having given us this moment. I'll stop here. Thank you. Sorry, this was longer than I intended, but I'd, I'd warned you. <laughs>